who we are, uh, but I can tell you while I share the presentation, I can tell you uh, the, the background a bit of, of uh, this, uh, this study. And, um, and so this is an effort in collaboration between our um, two universities, so and the, and the OGS, so University of Oxford, and where we work quite extensively on the Eastern Mediterranean, and um, we do have a database of uh, seismic data. And uh, we join forces with uh, Trieste um, because is is my screen okay, Sean? Because it's kind of flickering for me. Is yeah, it right? looks yeah, okay. it looks fine to me. Yeah. That's fine. So yeah, so we join forces with Trieste because basically they they have um, they've been studying our side risk for for a long time. They have the uh, in-house capabilities of doing modeling, both geophysical and hydrate modeling. And uh, uh, so both the, the, the university and the OGS um, are, are included in this project. And our basic question was to try to understand what happens when there, are, there is a giant evaporative basin, such as uh, the Messinian evaporative basin in the Mediterranean, uh, well, how that influences the, the, the development of gas hydrates. So we took this, uh, this case study, as Christina said, it was part of her MSc thesis. So uh, now she's doing a PhD, but this, this project was um, uh, last year. Uh, so while she was doing the MSc project, she did all the modeling of the entire Mediterranean. So I'm going to start just with some background information, the scope and the uh, the introduction, the examples of the gas hydrates, uh, possible evidence in the, in the Eastern Mediterranean, and then I'll hand it to Christina, and she's going to speak about the, the modeling part. So uh, the rationale, basically, of the project, uh, of this talk, but also the old project, is uh, uh, to, to, to study the Mediterranean basin, which is underlain by the Messinian evaporites, uh, which is especially in the eastern part, very rich of hydrocarbons of gas in particular. So it is kind of expected to have gas hydrates. However, we don't really see them that much, uh, especially on seismic where gas hydrates uh, tend to be quite prominent, quite visible through uh, the observation of BSRs, which I will show later. So uh, it's not, there are few evidence, there is very sparse evidence of the occurrence of gas hydrates. And the reasons behind this are very, are kind of poorly understood. So as I said, we use the twofold approach, the observational part, most based on seismic data, and then the modeling part, which we both extended to the entire Mediterranean, which was mostly based on wells. So the main question we wanted to answer um, is what happens basically to gas hydrates in a basin hosting a buried soil giant. And I'll give a very short introduction on gas hydrate and I'll, I'll leave Christina explaining the details. But as, as we, we probably all know, so gas hydrates are compounds which are made of gas molecules, so small gas molecules such as methane, ethane, CO2, H2S and others, uh, which are kind of encased in the water molecules. And um, because of the stability zone, basically they are subject to certain pressure and temperature condition mostly. So the, form the formation happens in sediments, uh, oceanic sediments or uh, areas like permafrost areas in land, where there are these uh, particular condition, temperature and pressure. And, and pressure. Uh, however, as you can see in this map, this map shows the distribution of the uh, observed gas hydrate. And uh, we got basically no to very few points, one point here in the Eastern Mediterranean, which I show later, but there is basically no occurrence of the gas hydrate here. Uh, another parameter, another uh, characteristic that uh, actually factor that influences their distribution is salinity. And I highlighted here because that's what, that's the link basically between the soil giants and the gas hydrates that we'll, we'll explore today. And there are many reasons why people study uh, gas hydrates. And I would say, you know, that the main ones are basically because 
uh, they are a potential, they are a, a greenhouse uh, gas. So methane is a greenhouse gas. And if dissociated all these gas hydrates in a, in a um, uh, environment of raising temperatures, then they would increase the amount of uh, greenhouse emissions to the atmosphere. And uh, the second reason is probably because uh, they are um, studied as potential energy resources for the future. So how do these uh, gas hydrate look on seismic? Again, uh, some classic examples of uh, what uh, the seismic show us. And, and these are all examples from Svalbard, from, from this publication, which was a general compilation of a lot of um, areas showing gas hydrates evidence. And you can see that this is the seabed and the BSR appears as a cross-cutting reflection, or in this case, like a top of the of a high amplitude anomalies uh, that is more or less mimicking the, the seafloor, the, the shape of the seafloor. And the same you can see here in this area and in this one, for example. And what you see here, there are increases in amplitudes, which are probably related to the free gas underneath the gas hydrate stability zone. So I got my gas hydrate from the top, and then when the, uh, they, they convert into free gas, basically, you got the high amplitude illuminating the sediment. Uh, so this is called BSR, and there are some spectacular examples. One of the best one is probably in uh, New Zealand, uh, offshore the, the northern island in the Ikurangi margin has been widely studied for, for uh, several reasons, including gas hydrates. And the, as you can see here, uh, this is the seabed, and we can see a very prominent cross cutting reflection here that you cross cutting this trust, trusted sediment, and here this anticline, and even here with a, with a classical you know, uh, amplitude increase in this area. So uh, the, in summary, basically what we are looking for in seismic to on seismic data to, to understand if there are any gas hydrates, uh, this expression mostly of this uh, uh, gas hydrate stability zone through the BSR. And this is a reflection that is roughly mimicking the seafloor because it depends mostly on temperature and pressure. It has the opposite polarity to the seafloor reflector because it is basically representing a soft kick on the seismic data. And if we're lucky and the reflection under the seabed are actually dipping, then it shows also cross-cutting relationships. Uh, in general, what, what gas hydro represents in sediments uh, is basically a, uh, the, the base of a, of a gas front. And uh, they, they are included in that big realm of uh, laterally widespread basin fluid flow. Uh, rather than focused, because we can find it for, for very large areas. And if we step, step back a little bit and we focus on how the, the, what, what kind of fluids we have in sedimentary basins and how these fit into it. So we, uh, th this is a very simple diagram. It's, it's taken basically so from textbook, uh, from the work of Bjorn Lick and Warren and other people who work a lot on fluids in sedimentary basins. And uh, what I wanted to highlight is that in sedimentary basins, like for example, a, a passive margin, a steel sad basin, we got uh, several types of, uh, of fluids in the basin and they create flow. Uh, these are upwards flow uh, and it's, it's a compactional flow. So when the, the sediments compact, they release um, upwards uh, fluids from the pore water. What happens is that this compaction of flow is actually very, very slow. So it's almost, in some cases, it's almost the same uh, um, speed, uh, let's say, as fast as the sedimentation. So you don't actually see flow. What is more prominent is actually deeper flow coming from different origins. So diagenesis, hydrocarbons, geothermal. Uh, so there are several contributors. And then we've got the meteoric flow which, uh, uh, well, this means that water is basically groundwater recharged from the mainland and then pushed into the basin. And in these uh, recent years, we are discovering that probably this goes much farther than what we expected. So it covers, uh, it gets at least into continental margin. And the meteoric flow is much faster than compaction of flow. So anyways, all this detour to, to, to understand. So what happens when we put uh, a salt giants in the middle of this basin? So buried evaporites, 
in the case of, uh, of many of the tall giants, we are talking about thicknesses of kilometers and kilometers of salt and other evaporites. So it does have a big impact on the fluid patterns in the basin. And in particular, what happens to the deeper basin is that they, they are normally kind of ascending fluids and they encounter this barrier of the evaporite because the evaporites, due to their mineralogical structure, they are uh, basically impermeable or nearly impermeable. So uh, if their fluids are trapped, we can get overpressure pockets. If they are free to move, we can get, uh, if they are undersaturated in evaporites, which normally they are, they, they can cause dissolution. Of, uh, of the salt. And here I put an example of what you can, you know, the, 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 we can create a density driven convective saline flow uh, while this is dissolved and then it sinks down and then it, it comes up again. But I think this is more prominent actually where we got salt diapers rather at the base of the big, uh, you know, uh, basin wide body of the rubber. Anyways, if these dissolved fluids manage to, uh, to reach, to escape and reach. Uh, the, the end of the salt basin, then they, they can escape, let's say they seal, and they have different ways they can get up to the seabed in different ways. And one of them is through faults. It's very common in this salt basin to have faults along the, especially the margins because of uh, gravitational gliding, because of the formation uh, at, the, at the margin of the, of the salt basin. So these can be very good carriers, especially if they get up to the seabed. Uh, you can also have a breach of uh, the salt, uh, the thick salt evaporites. We see some examples uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean. We see pipes that are basically created by extreme overpressure and hydrofracturing through the salt, or we can have uh, even uh, breaching due to dissolution and the collapse, the sort of a karstic um, uh, phenomena. Uh, on the top of the salt, what happens? We have several phenomena here as well that are linked to fluid movement. And one is the transformation that some minerals like gypsum uh, undergo while they are buried. So in this case, gypsum polluted the water and it's quite a lot because it's up to 40% of the volume of the, uh, of the gypsum uh, while it converts to an hydride. So when it goes down uh, in, in the basin. And uh, also these, these top evaporates can be actually uh, dissolved as we will see by simply the pore waters. And so what I thought it was particularly important for the case of the gas hydrates is to highlight how basically the dissolution of some ions like sodium chloride sulfate can happen and they can be transported in the sediments above in the overburden to the evaporates and these sediments become basically uh, more saline that they would be without the presence of the salt giant. And this we see that is quite important for the stability zone, the definition of the factors controlling the stability zone. Uh, so let's focus a bit on the solution and, and see where and how this occur. And okay, this is, we, we go somewhere else. We're not in a marine setting anymore. This is, onshore, this is Texas, and there are lots, a lot of these sinkholes. And this is purely related to karst. So is groundwater circulating in the sediments that are actually the overburden to the salt, uh, and they dissolve the salt and they create these uh, depletion zones, which are uh, then, uh, they, they, they result in the creation of this crater, this collapsed crater. And, uh, uh, so this is purely onshore with groundwater, and we're quite used to see that. It happens, of course, a lot also with carbonates. But um, we also know that the solution of evaporites uh, can happen also in submarine settings. Uh, and this is quite a nice example from the, oh, this, uh, I should mention that this is basically the stratigraphy related to the wing sink, the, the, the sinkhole that I showed before. So it, it's basically the dissolution of this, the salt in the, uh, in the salado formation. So it's quite deep. Uh, while this is an example up here from the Gulf of Mexico, so we are in deep waters, we got the two-way time here, we got three seconds, uh, so we are, we are very deep, and uh, this blue uh, area, so, so this is the allotment of salt, and what happens is that it crops out on the seabed, and so the seawater actually dissolves the salt, it's undersaturated in, in, in halide compared to the, to the salt, to the rock salt, so it dissolves the salt, 
and then it creates a, a prime pool. I will show some example of this later. So this solution can happen in submarine environments, and finally, it can happen in submarine environments, but even in buried settings. So in this case, this was a, a, a paper from a while ago uh, uh, from, from my PhD, where uh, I was studying basically the salt, the Messinian salt in the Eastern Mediterranean. And uh, you can see this section uh, is, is going through, uh, so this is the salt uh, from the horizon named M to N, going here and then here and thinking out on this side. And you can see there is, uh, the salt is mm -hmm. deformed here. Uh, so the, um, the, the, the basically the, the, there is a, a U-shaped uh, feature on the top of the salt. This is due to push down on the base, so it should be flat. So the salt is depleted in this area. So we were able to uh, refer this structure, to interpret this structure as a collapse feature. And the interesting part is that this is structurally rooted in uh, Pliocene sediments. And the Pliocene was fully marine at the time. So we were able to date this structure as happening in the late Pliocene and where the conditions were fully marine and when the salt was buried under this section of sediments, of deep water sediments. So again, so the solution can happen in any sort of setting as far as you allow the uh, saturated brines to be removed, as we see also, um, we'll, I'll explain also on this, uh, with this example. So this another example from the Eastern Mediterranean is the Banok Basin, which is in the, uh, near the Mediterranean Ridge, uh, on the Mediterranean Ridge, and this was, uh, a paper by Angelo Camerlenghi, so it's one of the authors of this project, and he was actually uh, studying these amazing brine lakes that are under uh, on the seafloor of the Mediterranean. So you see that the, the seabed here is at 3,000 meters, and these lakes are underneath that. And uh, I, I, I couldn't find I saw images of this on seismic or similar examples in the Eastern Mediterranean, but I couldn't find it for the talk. So again, I put an example from uh, Gulf of Mexico and look at this. Basically, this horizon is the top of the brine pool. So it's quite amazing that you can see on the side, it's so dense that the seismic is actually picking the top of this lake, um, underwater lake. And uh, so what, what Angelo uh, was trying to understand is the mechanism of formation of the brine lakes. And in this case, what happens is that the salt, which is this diamond pattern here, is uh, outcropping uh, in this area, for example, on the steep wall, and it was dissolved and then concentrated into these um, basins, uh, provided that were deep enough, the circulation, the water circulation allowed it. Uh, they, they they created these lakes in many uh, in, in in the several other places in the uh, Mediterranean region. And um, the the but also what what is interesting that he was talking also about what can happen to the salt when it's buried at depth and how it can be dissolved. And uh, he was uh, presenting several mechanisms by which that can happen. And the main point, I think, it was that the, the brine, the, the seawater, or the solute that will dissolve the water, the, the salt needs to be removed. Once it has dissolved the salt, it needs to be removed. And how can that happen? It can happen through diffusion, so slow uh, movement through, through the sediments, so to the overburden of the salt, or it can happen through fractures, and then in that case, it's much faster uh, flow. So provided that there is that circulation, type of circulation, then we can dissolve several, you know, the considerable part of the of the buried salt. And um, in the case of the Messinian, uh, basically, even if uh, we only use this um, diffusion or osmosis, uh, as Angelo was uh, was suggesting. Uh, in a few million years, probably uh, this this um, this salt would have permeated the pore waters of the sediments almost up to the seabed. So, what what does uh, uh, this leave us? So, basically, uh, th this is probably a contributing factor that we will uh, Tristina will will um, uh, explore in in her part of the talk, and uh, it will be. Uh, focus on her modeling is focused on the entire Mediterranean because she wanted to see the uh, relationship between 
the gas hydrostability zone and the distribution of the vaporites. And this is a, a classic map from uh, um, Joanna Lofi et al. published in 2018, the second edition of the Atlas of the Seismic, the markers, the seismic markers of the Messina and Salinity crisis in the Mediterranean. A very thorough work that shows a lot, a lot of example of this salt basin. So a real, a real reference work. And uh, if we focus on the Eastern Mediterranean, so this is our main area of interest because in the Eastern Mediterranean, we know that there is gas, uh, right? And another important thing is that there are lots of mud volcanoes. And I, I will show you now what's the relationship between the mud volcanoes and the gas hydrate. This map is focused on the Eastern Mediterranean. You can see here, Libyan promontory, Greece, and um, the Nile cone here, all these yellow dots are mud volcanoes that were mapped by, by Masco. And this, this paper is uh, in particular is from a work by Nikita Sakal on the Olympia mud volcano. But all these are mud volcanoes. And you can see that lots of them are related to the, to the collisional zone here, the, 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 the Mediterranean ridge basically. And, and a lot of them are related here in the Nile Delta. And if we look at one of them, this is the Naximander mountain area, which uh, even if it's called a mountain, it's actually a subsea mountain. So the, 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 this, there is this Amsterdam volcano here. Uh, and uh, uh, in this study, they, they show how this was basically sampled. They went there and uh, they took samples of the seabed and they found uh, hydrates basically in the, in the sediments. So this is a very clear evidence of the presence of hydrates in the Eastern Mediterranean connected to mud volcanoes. There are other types of studies. So if we move, uh, we were here, if we move a bit farther to the east, so Nile uh, Cone is here, we go to the Levant Basin. Uh, so in this re research, Tiber et al. have um, actually had uh, uh, used an inverse approach. They, they did the modeling for the gas hydrostability zone and then they double check with the seismic what well, that uh, model depth would uh, correspond on seismic, correspond to on seismic. So this is seismic section, the green horizon is the interpreted high amplitude anomalies and the yellow is the modeled gas hydrate stability zone, the base of the gas hydrate stability zone. So if you can see in this zoom, uh, there is a correspondence in some areas of these two reflectors uh, however, again, we don't have a clear BSR. We have amplitude anomalies, uh, but we don't have a clear continuous BSR in the region. And another example, so sorry for the quality of this slide, but I couldn't find, there is a, a more recent uh, uh, paper by these authors, uh, but I couldn't find it for this presentation. Um, so again, in the Nile Delta, vintage data uh, from 1969, 1981, which are actually um, hosted by, by OGS, so the institution when, where Christina, Angelo, and the other co-authors work. And uh, this um, la seismic line shows uh, the seabed here in quite deep water. And then you see this is the interpreted base of the gas hydrate stability zone. However, I should also point out that this is a modified image. It's got some dashes on it. I don't know if they're visible, but it's very difficult to appreciate. I think that they're amplitude anomalies are here and here and here. And it's quite difficult on this kind of data. I've been told the people looking at the regional data that it's very difficult to see anyways, more um, examples of, of the BSR, other examples of the BSR in this area. So again, the last examples, I'm just gonna show on seismic in the area is, and probably is the best one, it's from the PhD thesis of Haruka Med. And this, uh, it was in Cairo University, now it's in uh, Shell, Egypt, I believe. Uh, so it was working with 3D data, very nice 3D data. And uh, it was working actually on something else. It was working on the plyopaternary sediments of this area and on the MTDs, on the mass transport deposits. And what he noticed is that there is this kind of cross-cutting um, BSR or, or high amplitude reflections, the polarity seemed to be uh, different from the seabed, it's not opposite, and, and so he, his interpretation was that these are BSRs. So there was a bit also uh, our experience on, on, on the data 
uh, that we we hold at Oxford. Today I cannot show them uh, because they they, uh, they they are protected by confidentiality agreement. But um, uh, and we we are aiming to to publish them. But the the idea is that this BSR in this area, for example, is present where there are little Mersinian evaporites, or there are there is a discontinuous presence of the evaporites. It's not like where it is thick tabular salt. This area is more close to the margin of the evaporites. And uh, the other observation is that the BSR where observed is really really patchy. So these are really the best examples that you can you can see. So the, the, in, in summary, I would like to, uh, to I would like to summarize just the, the observation that we made on the seismic data and the, the, the examples that we we have shown in the Eastern Mediterranean. The, the other people have published in the Eastern Mediterranean are either very confined locally, so they are associated to mud volcanoes, or especially on seismic data, they they are very patchy, so they they show a very patchy response. So there is no clear continuous evidence of BSR recorded in the Eastern Mediterranean, even though this is a rich gas-rich basin. And, and so we, we wanted to uh, understand why, but seismic alone cannot give the definite answer. So that's where the modeling part comes in and is trying to provide additional support to the interpretation of where the BSR is observed or and help explain why hydrates are not present uh, in in other parts of the basins. So um, basically, the, the main question is that how does that link to the behavior of the gas hydrates uh, when they overlie thick evaporites? And uh, with this, I'll end on to Christina. Thank you, Claudia. Um, I will share my screen. Can you see it? Yes, you just yeah. need to go full screen. Oh, we see in presenter view. If you just switch to what? Can you repeat? Uh, you, it's on presenter view at the moment. So if you switch to full screen view, um, it's in Italian. So I'm not sure. It's one of the options. <laughs> the, one okay. of the options at the top should allow you to switch it to. Um... Just a second. Okay. Uh, 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 uh. Uh, so one of those options at the top there now, I think one of them allows you to switch to uh, presenting mode. Let's do something different because okay. I have two Excuse screens. Me, uh, so the option to if... the right is the one. Okay. This should oh, be yeah. okay. Yep. Okay. Now we see it. Great. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, hi everybody. I'm Christina, and I will present you the second part of the speech, and this is about the lack of widespread gas hydrate evidence in Mediterranean Sea. Uh, as, as, as Claudia said before, my project was my master thesis uh, and an internship with OGS, and we considered all the Mediterranean Sea, so the entire area and not just the Levantine Basin. Uh, and we want to focus on possible explanations on uh, about this lack of, of uh, evidence. So let's see if I can move. Okay, uh, so I just want to not to repeat what Claudia said about methane hydrates, but I just want to add something like um, we have some requirement for the formation of hydrates. Uh, first of all, we need to have the availability of the primary component, we need to have the gas, we need to have the water, of course. We need to have a reservoir, so like uh, geology uh, field in which hydrate can be stacked. And we need to have a stability field. Um, the stability field depends on different factors like pressure, like temperature, salinity, and um, a lot of others. But what's important to, to know is that the methane hydro stability zone can be considered like a volume with a top surface and a bottom. And this um, volume can vary in time because the reaction of the formation of hydrates is a endothermic and reversible reaction. So the formation of hydrate can be only inside this uh, methane hydrate stability zone, but to have the preservation in time of hydrates, we need to have the um, maintaining in time even of this uh, 
conditions. So considering all the fluctuation, the climate variability that we had uh, in the past and we are having now, we cannot consider the methane hydrate stability zone like a, a stable and constant uh, situation and can fluctuate and move upward, downward, and can be thinner or thicker. Um, so in oceanic basins, what we know about uh, methane hydro stability zone is that it's, it has a top depth that is around uh, more or less 300, 600 meter below the sea surface, and the thickness can, can vary. But uh, the main question is, uh, what are the characteristics of methane hydro stability zone that I will call MHZ for simplicity in uh, the Mediterranean Sea, if we know that it's a basin that is saltier and warmer, um, respect the oceanic basins. And so just uh, very quickly, um, the most important, more important factors that can influence the stability, as I said before, one of them is temperature. Um, you can see the um, phase diagram on the right. You have temperature on x axis and the pressure slash depth on the epsilon axis. Uh, axis. You can see that um, if you have a temperature, a specific temperature, you will have a minimum depth to have the formation of hydrate. So hydrate will begin to form at least a depth or deeper. The yellow part is the stability field. And what we, uh, what's important to notice is that if we have a positive temperature anomaly, so we have to, I don't know, we increase the temperature, you can see that we will have the formation of hydrates that begins deeper. Uh, that's the effect of temperature. It's shift, increasing the temperature, we will shift the, the top downward and we will reduce the thickness of the uh, volume of MHZ. And this is important to know in Mediterranean Sea because we know that this basin is a closed sedimentary basin. So we have the, for example, the temperature of the seafloor that lays around 11 to 13 degrees uh, Celsius degrees uh, versus the four degrees average, four degrees of the uh, oceanic basins. Um, and the geothermal gradient too is important in the, especially in the Western part of uh, Mediterranean Sea because we have, um, a very uh, younger, uh, young, um, young, young lithosphere, um, very thin sedimentary coverage. So the geothermal gradient is even three times the one in the eastern part. Um, what's about the role of the salt? Uh, we know that salt is an inhibitor for the formation of hydrates. And that's because of the major affinity that water shows to ions instead of the hydrate structure. Uh, you can see on the left, the first graph, this is from Dickens and Queen Bee Hunt, 2006. Uh, it's a graph that has uh, is pressure versus temperature. And they model the stability curve of hydrates, considering uh, samples of seawater and pure water, where seawater was uh, 33 parts per thousand of uh, salinity. And you can see that if you consider uh, the same pressure, you will have the formation of hydrates or the dissolution, depending on which side you're looking at the graph, uh, that become, uh, the, the formation will begin at lower temperature and it's more or less one degree the difference. Um, so if you look to the graph on the right, you can, um, what, what we can assume is that if we have an increase in salinity, the curve of stability will move on the left. So again, a positive salinity anomaly will uh, lead uh, reducing in thickness of the methane hydro stability zone. Um, yeah, this is a map that uh, I already show you. So this is a map from Joanna Loffi that shows the uh, evaporized deposit in Mediterranean Sea. And uh, we started from this point. So know that those salt giants are present. What can we expect the salinity to, to be? Obviously the salinity gradient are influenced from, uh, by the presence of these salt giants. Uh, on the left, you have a graph that represents a normal salinity gradient in sediments. So you have the water column, then you have the seafloor and the salinity gradient in the sediments. Uh, this is from a site, an ODP site in the Alboran Basin where we don't have salt giants. And you can see that in 670, so 600 and more meters, you have a delta of salinity that is around three, uh, 36 parts per thousand. 
And on the right, you can see that if you have uh, evaporites uh, in uh, um, like 500 meters, um, a bit more, you have a delta of salinity that is around 270 part per thousand, so a lot more. And this is the huge positive salinity anomaly that so giants um, lead in sediments of, sediment of Mediterranean Sea. Uh, so the main purpose of this work was to quantify uh, the effect. So we, okay, we know that salinity and temperature has a role and has an effect on methane hydrostability zone. So how can we can quantify this, this effect? Um, to do this, we built two models, one for the top and the other one for the base of MHZ. The top was made for all the Mediterranean Sea using Copernicus data set. Um, and the, the one for the base actually was split in two and was uh, the data from ODP and the STP sites were used um, because we needed some information of temperature and sediments and that was, you know, were public. So we took this one from 44 sites. And the model was run with two input information. So the first time with real salinity information, so the real uh, information that we got from the report, and the second time, excluding the effect of salinity. So taking the salinity of the seafloor and considering it constant for the uh, entire depth of the hole. And I will show you two examples that we obtained. The first one for the Western Mediterranean Sea and the second one for the Eastern. Um, I will make this comparison because as I said before, Western Mediterranean Sea is generally different from the Eastern part. Um, you can see in this case, you have the first graph on the left. It's the curve of salinity. You can see you have evaporite. So you can you have a great and important uh, positive salinity anomaly. Uh, the second graph is temperature. You have a, a hydrothermal gradient. The third and the fourth are um, the stability graph. So we have in blue the hydrostatic pressure and in green, the stability pressure of methane hydrates. So first thing I want you to notice is that the depth of the top lays at 1,120 meters and not more if you remember the 300, 600 meters of oceanic basins. And the second thing I want you to notice is that the green line is split in two. And these, those are the two cases that I already mentioned. So the first one, uh, the continuous line, is the stability pressure calculated with real salinity information with the data of the first graph on the left. And the other one is the curve calculated with a constant salinity equal to the C4 one. You can see with, that with real salinity information with, and so with a positive salinity anomaly, you have that the base is shifted upward. So you have a reducing thickness of the MHZ and the volume. And the difference here is more or less uh, 10 meters a bit more. But if you look at the Eastern Mediterranean Sea case, where we have again evaporites, so again we have a positive salinity anomaly that is important, um, we have a low geothermal gradient. Um, again, we have in blue the hydrostatic pressure, and the two green lines are the stability pressure. In this case, you can see that the effect of the salinity anomaly, if we have low geothermal gradient, is of shifting upward the base, but of more than 100 meters, 130 meters. And this was not the most dramatic case. Um, so what we can assume from this is that we, if you have both of temperature and salinity has an effect, but if you have a low geothermal gradient, the effect of salinity is even more important and more, uh, more big. Um, then uh, another thing that uh, we discussed when we talk about the lack of evidence uh, of methane hydrates is the fact that probably not mm, all of the primary component that we uh, need as a requirement for the formations uh, for the formation of hydrates are present and in particular we focused on uh, biogenic methane so uh, we know that biogenic methane is uh, productive in the methanogenic zone that starts below the uh, sulfate reduction zone. 
um, sulfur reduction zone and with the um, when the uh, sulfate ions concentration reach more or less the zero. But if we have uh, buried soul giants, and as Claudia mentioned before, we have molecular diffusions of ions from evaporites upward, uh, we will hardly reach the zero of the sulfate ion concentration. So uh, with some difficulty, the methanogenic zone will, uh, will be reached. In fact, what we made was to check the um, sulfate ion concentration for all those sites that we uh, considered. And uh, we saw that just for and only for Algoran Basin, where we don't have um, soul giants, we have that the methanogenic zone is reached. So probably this is one, this one factor has to be considered. And the second one is thermogenic methane. Um, thermogenic methane is present, but is generally, generally produced at depths that are deeper than um, the soul giants deposits. So we know that soul giants and evaporites are impermeable um, deposits. So probably uh, the upward flux is quite limited from, uh, from them. So um, this is a map that shows in the red contour the RL extension of methane hydrostability zone in the Mediterranean Sea. And the dark blue area represents uh, the evaporite, the soul giant evaporite uh, extension. Um, you can see that the two areas uh, overlay quite well. And so what we can um, understand from this is that we can expect to have this huge positive salinity anomaly more or less uh, everywhere. Um, and so this uh, important factor must be considered. Um, yeah, so just to conclude, so uh, reasons uh, for not having uh, widespread evidence of methane hydrates. First of all, because of the Mediterranean basin itself. So it's a close sedimentary basin, high seafloor temperature, and that's uh, a factor that limits the extension, vertical extension of MHZ. And in particular, we found that the bathymetric minimum to have uh, the existence of MHZ is 1,130 meters. Um, again, the hydrothermal gradient in the western part obviously uh, is an important, important factor. And then a lot of factors due to soil giants. So the positive salinity anomaly uh, of interstitial salinity that we have, the biogenic production that maybe is limited because of the sulfate ion um, diffused by evaporites, the, the thermogenic methane that probably is uh, limited by the impermeable subgiants. And the last point that we wanted to, uh, to discuss was that is that um, subgiants are not a characteristics of uh, uh, Mediterranean Sea only, but we can find them in Atlantic Ocean, Ocean, Indian Ocean, etc. So if we want to consider the methane hydrostability zone model and we want to maybe uh, consider some future methane hydrate assessment, we need to uh, consider the salinity and the salinity anomaly from uh, soil giants. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Christina and Claudia for a very engaging presentation. And we have uh, some questions in the chat. Let me say here is a question from uh, Mark Rowan. Yes, thank you both. And I'll just say before Noah starts the questions, if anyone has a question, please put in the Q&A box rather than the, the chat. So then we only have to focus on one thing. Um, okay, yes, thank you both. And I think we have some questions already. So Noah, go ahead. Yes, uh, I, we have a question from Mark Rowan. And he said the Orca Basin is uh, very unusual compared to Gulf of Mexico that the salt is exposed and we see the brine pool. The vast majority of shallow salt, however, is buried beneath the mud-rich roof. Even if quite thin, this appears to impede any significant dissolution. And yet that mud should have adequate permeability and there are plenty of isolated lows at the seafloor. Can you please comment on why we see so little apparent dissolution? Uh, 
Yes, very, very interesting question for Mark. I'm not sure I can answer. So I um, I don't know much about the, the Gulf of Mexico. And um, so I, I'm not sure I, I, I know exactly the setting. Uh, the, the, there is probably the, the fact that uh, so it needs uh, the, 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 the water needs to be able to to reach the salt. What I'm thinking about is that the, the water needs to be able to reach the salt, but also to be removed. So for, for some reason, there is not this uh, mechanism probably of, of um, uh, fluid, you know, the, this, uh, this basic circulation. I, I, I don't know. Uh, it would be an interesting case study actually to compare. Yeah, I'm not sure I can say anything else. Thank you for the question, though. It's very interesting. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, we have another question from uh, Salim Shaker. He says, uh, is the depth of 1120 meters associated with specific lithology or beginning of the sediment compaction? Uh, well, no, this depth was calculated uh, taking information of water masses. So, um, because it, it refers to the, the top of MHZ. So this is the depth, um, the minimum depth over which the stability can exist, uh, considering temperature and salinity of the water column. So this is not uh, associated with lithology or sediment compaction. Okay. I hope I answer. Okay. Yeah, we have another question from Gonzalez uh, Calvo. Uh, it says why there is a relationship between mud volcanoes and methane hydrates. Uh, Claudia, if you want to, um, I I think it's uh, because uh, it's, it provides the conduit. I mean, mud volcanoes are, are associated with gas emissions as well. So basically, even in settings where where the result mud volcanoes are able to, to cross the salt and, and provide this an increased amount of gas. Uh, I don't know, Christina, if there are any other chemical, physical reasons. Well, uh, when we uh, looked at the site, ODP and the SDP site that were mud volcanoes, what we noticed was that the salinity uh, curve uh, did not show any, not always this salinity anomaly. Um, the curve was really um, not linear. Uh, we don't have a positive salinity anomaly. Sometimes we had even negative salinity anomaly for some uh, um, small part. So probably the effect of salt, for example, in those cases can be, um, can, is not possible to have. So probably this is why we have, met, we have methane hydrates in mud volcanoes with more easily. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we have uh, an answer from Frank Peel for Mark Rowan's question. And he says, perhaps the reason why a thin marine mud layer is sufficient to stop salt dissolving might be that there is no driver for fluid flow through the mud, a question mark. And only a thin layer of sediment below the sea floor, so little compaction driven pore water flow, question. Uh, it's certainly a bit of mystery. This was something from Frank. Thank you, Frank, for uh, your uh, comment. And also we have another question from uh, John Davies. He asks that, uh, what influence do earthquakes have on gas hydrates stability? Shaking, uh, liquefying sediment, associated debris flow, reducing load and, and pressure destabilizing hydrates. So I think he's asking, these number of uh, possibilities. So what is the influence of earthquakes on gas hydrate stability? The, the example I, I can think of is the, I think is the Storiaga uh, uh, landslide. Um, so yes, of course, if you, if you do remove the, uh, if you increase, decrease the pressure by removing the, the overburden suddenly, then I think you can cause a, a, a massive release of hydrates. I guess you change the, the, the pressure, uh, the stability field. And I think the, the Storyaga was actually associated with that. Okay. And also we have another question from uh, Sofiane. Uh, 
This is uh, in Western Mediterranean Sea. Are there potential zones to produce gas hydrates? Uh, Claudia, want you? Christina. Okay. Uh, so, um, well, yes. So the Mediterranean methane hydrostability zone uh, is there. So we model it, and we have even that the effect of the salt is not that important because of the temperature. But if you remember, the temperature uh, is has a role too, and we have a geothermal gradient that is even three times the one, the one in the Eastern Mediterranean Sea. So uh, I don't know, probably yes, but they didn't find anything yet. So the, we have to consider that, that the lack of evidence is even there, even if seismic line uh, passed even in the Western Mediterranean Sea. So, well, <laughs> I don't know how, how to answer more than this. Okay, thank you. And also we have another question from uh, Gonzalo Calvo. He says, uh, do gas hydrate accumulations explode when the water column on top of uh, them disappears like the Messinian crisis? Yeah, that's a, that's a very, very good question. And it's a, it's a fascinating topic. I, indeed, if, uh, if there were gas hydrates uh, before the Messinian salinity crisis, then we would expect that if there was a, a, a big sea level drop, then it would have influenced the stability of, of the gas hydrates. There are some evidences actually of uh, gas hydrates. Uh, so there is some evidence of gas hydrate release linked to the Messina and Salinity crisis. And I think it's mostly onshore. There are some examples in Spain uh, or at least they've been interpreted as um, due to that. Uh, uh, and uh, also in central Italy, uh, where they, 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 they hypothesized that that was the case. So yes. Okay, thank you. We have another question from Sofiane. It says, based on the seismicity in the Western Mediterranean, is there any risk to drill offshore wells? Any risk associated uh, with offshore wells? I'm, I'm, I'm not sure, yeah. I don't know if you can answer, Christine. I, I... I really don't know. Um, okay. okay. I think it's, yeah. I, I, it's, it's, okay. No, go for it. Sorry, Christina. <laughs> then we have uh, two uh, comments for the presentation. One from uh, Sofiane. Thanks, Claudia and Christina, for excellent presentation. And also there is a, someone who said, uh, Carlos Geraldo, sorry, Claudia and Christina, we arrived late. Please recommend Hi, a paper on this topic. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I can, I can write to, to Carlos. Uh, okay. Hi, Carlos, <laughs> and okay. send him the paper. And also a question from Catherine Giles. Uh, she said, Claudia, are dissolution sag basins always subcircular or are there more uh, elongate linear sag basins. Oh yeah, definitely. Uh, geometry. Yeah, 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 definitely. So yeah, the, the um, Catherine is is absolutely right. There are uh, uh, subcircular ba basins, but there are also elongated basins, and um, um, and they are the, the ones at least we see in uh, in the Levant. Uh, they are connected mostly either to, to structure, structural development, or to the to the um, pinch out of the salt area. So basically, the, the, there are sort of dissolution modes apart from the the deformation of the salt due to to the to the sliding, you know, basin or sliding of the salt. But there is also there are dissolution modes along the edges. So those are more linear. Or oh, there are others that seem seem a bit like the the, the karstic one, the, the the more linear features. So there are all sorts of geometries. The interesting thing about the subcircular ones, they are quite diagnostic, I guess, of of dissolution because there are not many other things that can cause it. You know, once you exclude the other options. So yes. Yeah. Thank you. If there is any other question, I don't see any other question right now. 
Uh, if there is any other question you can ask, we may have a minute or two or a little more also. Yeah, I think we yeah, are. Yeah, I think, I think we're all done with the questions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Great, thank you both then for a very interesting talks and clearly a lot of interest in this topic and in the Mediterranean in general. So yeah, that was great. And uh, thank you all for joining as well. I hope that was uh, interesting for you as it was for us. And we have one more webinar in this series, which is in two weeks time. And that will be uh, Lorraine and Moscadelli, I think, if my spreadsheet is up to date. So please join us for that in the final webinar of this series. and. Thank you again, Christina and Claudia. Very interesting talks. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks you. to everybody. Thank you, Claudia. Thank, Thank you, you all. Bye. Bye, Bye, bye. all. Bye.